Varden for the rest of his life without ever finding his way free. When it rained the clouds in the forests, Ganymede plunged them into profound darkness as if they were entombed deep underground. The falling water would collect on the black pine needles above them, trickle through and pour a hundred feet or more down onto their heads like a thousand little waterfalls. At such times, Araya would summon a glowing orb of green magic that floated over her hand and provided the only light in the cavernous forest. They would stop and huddle underneath the tree until the storm abated, but even, even then, water cached in the mirad branches, in the mirad branches, and would have the slightest provocation, shower them with droplets for hours afterwards. As they rode deep into the heart of Duwald and Varden, the trees grew thicker and taller as well as farther apart to accommodate the increased span of branches. The tree trunks bare brown shafts that towered up into the overarching ripped ceiling which was smudged and obscured by shadows were over 300 feet tall, higher than any tree in the spine or the boars. Aragon paced out the girth of one tree and measured it at 70 feet. I hope you guys can't see my face. He mentioned this to Araya and she nodded, saying it means that we are near Elsmara. She reached out and rested her hand lightly on the gnarled shrewd beside her, as if touching with the consummate delicacy the shoulder of a friend or a lover. These trees are the oldest living creatures in Adel Chelsea. Elves have loved them since first we saw Dwalt and Varden, and we have done everything within our power to help them flourish. A faint blade of light pierced the dusty emerald branches overhead and lined her arm and face with liquid gold, dazzling bright against the murky background. We have traveled far together, Aragon, but now you are about to enter my world. Tread softly, for the earth and air are heavy with memories, and naught is as it seems. Do not fly with Sophia today, as we have already triggered certain wards that protect Elsmara. It would be unwise to stay from the path. Aragon bowed his head and retreated to Safira, who lay curled in a bed of moss, amusing herself by releasing plumes of smoke from her nostrils and watching them roll out of sight. Without preamble, she said, There is plenty of room for me on the ground now. I will have no difficulty. Good. He mounted Falkvir and followed Oric and the elves far into the empty silent forest. Safira crawled behind him. She and the white horses gleamed in the somber half-light. Aragon paused, overcome by the solemn beauty of the surroundings. Everything had a feeling of wintry age, as if nothing had changed under the thatched needles for a thousand years, and nothing ever would. Time itself seemed to have fallen into a slumber from which it would never wake. In the late afternoon, the gloom lifted to reveal an elf standing before them, sheathed in a brilliant ray of light that slanted down from the ceiling. He was garbed in flowing robes with a circlet of silver upon his brow. His face was old, noble, and serene. Arrogant, murmured Araya, show him your palm and your ring. Bearing his right hand, Aragon raised tasted so that first Brom's ring and then the gateway Ignatia was visible. The elf smiled, closed his eyes, and spread his arms in a gesture of welcome. He held the posture. The way is clear, said Araya, at a soft command. Her steed moved forward. They rode around the elf like water parting at the base of a weathered boulder. And when they had all passed, he straightened clasped his hand and vanished as the light that illuminated him ceased to exist. Who is he? Asked Sephira. Sephira is the dragon, guys. Okay. Araya said, He is Kildarian, the wise prince, the wise prince of house, Miolandra, wielder of the white flame of Vandal and guardian of Els Elsmera. Since the days of Dufin, Skullblack, 
its eyes, resolving everything into recognizable shapes. Those were pots, I, and those were flowers, I, but what he had taken to be clustered of lumpy, twisted trees were in fact graceful buildings that grew directly out of the pines. One tree bowed at the base to form a two-story house before sinking its root into the loam. Both the stories were hexagonal, although the upper levels were half as small as the first, which gave the house a tiered appearance. The roofs and the walls were made of webbed sheets of wood draped over six ridges. Moss and yellow lichen bearded the eaves and hung over jeweled window set. Each into each side, the front window was the front door was a mysterious black silhouette recessed under an archway with wrought with symbols. Another house was nettled, nestled between the three pines, which were joined to it through a series of curved branches, reinforced by those flying buttresses. The house rose five levels, light and airy. Beside it sat a barber woven out of willow and dogwood and hung with flameless lanterns disguised as gulls. Each unique building enhanced and complemented its surroundings, blending seamlessly with the rest of the forest until it seemed impossible to tell where artifice ended and nature resumed. The true the two were in perfect balance. Instead of mastering the environment, the elves had chosen to accept the world as it was and adopt themselves to it. The inhabitants of Elsmera Elsmera eventually revealed themselves as a flicker of movement at the fringe of Ericon's sight, no more than needless st starings in the breeze. Then he caught glimpses of hands, a pale face, a sandaled foot, an upraised arm. One by one, the wary elves stepped into view, their almond eyes fixed upon Safira, Araya, and Aragorn. The women wore their hair unbound. It trippled down their backs in waves of silver, sample braided with fresh blossoms, like a garden waterfall. They all posed in a delicate ethereal beauty, possessed a delicate ethereal beauty that belied their unbreakable strength. To arrogant, they seemed flawless. The men were just as striking, with high cheekbones, finely sculpted noses, and heavy eyelid. Both both sexes were garbed in rustic tunics of green and brown, fringed with dusky colors of orange, russet, and gold. The fair folk, indeed, thought Aragon. He touched his lips in greetings, and as one, the elves bowed from the waist. Then they smiled and laughed with unrestrained happiness. From within the mist, a woman sang. Aragon clasped his ears over his ears, fearing that the melody was a spell like the one he had heard in Sildrim, but Arya shook her head and lifted his hands. It is not magic. Then she spoke to a horse, saying, Ganga. The stallion nickered and trotted away. Released your seeds, did as well. We have no further need of them, and they deserve to rest in our stables. The song waxed stronger as as Araya proceeded along a cobblestone path set with bits of green tourmaline which looped among the holy oaks and the houses and the trees before finally crossing a stream. The elves danced around their party as they walked, flitting here and there as the fancy struck, around, struck them, laughing and occasionally leaping onto a branch to run over their head. They praised Safira 
lips as bright and red as holy berries and midnight hair bound under a diamond diadem. Her tunic was crimson. Round her hips hung a girdle of braided gold. And clasped at the hollow of her neck was a velvet cloak that fell to the ground in languid folds. Despite her imposing countenance, the queen seemed fragile, fragile as if she concealed a great pain. By her left hand was a curved sword with a chased cross piece, a brilliant white raven. Perched on it, shuffling impatiently from foot to foot, he cocked his head and surveyed Aragon with uncanny intelligence, then gave a long croak and shrieked, Rider! Aragon shivered from the force of that single cracked word. The door closed behind the sixth of them as they entered the hall and approached the queen. Arya knelt on the moss-covered ground and bowed first, then Aragon, Auric, Lafayette, and Nari, even Safira, who had never bowed to anyone, not even a jihad or Rothgar, lowered her head. Islanzadi stood and descended from the throne, her cloak trailing behind her. She stopped before Arya. Arya. Araya. God. Placed trembling hands on her shoulders and said in a rich vibrato, Rise. Araya did, and the queen scrutinized her face with increasing intensity until it seemed as if she were trying to deserve her. Uh, an obscure task. At last, Islanzati cried out and embraced Araya, saying, Oh my. 